Welcome to The Church. I'm Brittany, where our vision is to build a church for God around the presence of God. Thank you for joining us today. Our prayer is that this word aligns you with God, connects you in your daily experience as we all advance His kingdom. As this word encourages you, don't forget to share it with a friend. Well, hey, today is a very special day at the church. Yes. This is our second time doing this, but the first Sunday in June here at TC, we call Generation Sunday. Generation Sunday! And I just love it because, I love it because, see, uh, I'm a bit of a, I'm a bit of a, I don't want to say a rebel because I feel like that's a bad word, but I'm a bit of a rebel and I feel like if the devil's going to try to come and put this label over the month of June that I'm just going to rise up and kick him in the face and say, no, 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 it's generation month. All right, we're going to celebrate the generations, the things that God is doing generationally, right, in his church and through his people. So I love that. You know, the Bible says that this is the day the Lord has made, right? I shall rejoice and be glad in it. So look, they can call it whatever they want to call it, right? They can call this month whatever they want to call it. I'm just giving you some encouragement right now because I know we're about to just go out there and you see it all over, right? Which is fine. I ain't mad about all that. They doing what they're expected to be doing, right? Look, we can't get mad when the devil be the devil, right? We just got to make sure that we be in the church, right so this is the day the lord has made and we shall rejoice and be glad in it so don't let nobody try to trick you into thinking that the devil owns nothing he don't own no day he don't own no month he don't own no hour not nothing this is the day the lord has made and we will rejoice and be glad in it hallelujah so today we have something special for you on generation sunday we have set how many are there seven six we have six of our young people uh from junior high all the way up to young adult adult that are going to come and they're going to bring the word today isn't that awesome and they are as you know the first sunday here at tc is typically value sunday so typically i get to come up and minister on the values but today they're going to be ministering on the value of family Amen. I cannot wait to hear what they have to say about the value of family. I wanted to share a quote with you that I read some time back, but it was so profound. It says, Christianity is just a generation away from extinction. Unless churches make a dramatic breakthrough in attracting young people back to the faith, uh, Christianity will be extinct. And the Archbishop of Canterbury in uh in uh great britain he said that and it's so true if we don't do our part as adults to train up the next generation christianity will be extinct because how will they know right how will they know we pastor sunny and i feel so passionate about this you know we believe we have a responsibility a responsibility, a mandate to raise up, to train up the next generation. We're passionate about it. And I wanted to take us uh, to a scripture. I'm not going to be long. I'm sorry. I know. I know. Uh, Mark 10, they laugh. Mark 10, uh, chapter 13. It says, people were bringing little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them. But the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. Indignant means he was hot mad, okay? He said to them, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, right? And do not hinder them. That right there spoke to me because sometimes as adults, we get so in our own way, right? That we hinder the next generation from coming to know Jesus, right? Because we make it all about us. We make it all about us. We think that our service that takes place in here is more important and that our butt being in that seat is more important than investing and training and teaching the next generation in this room and in that room back there. 
And let me share something with you. And I say this in all love, but I'm going to say it because the Holy Ghost is telling me. Look, a, a couple of Sundays ago, we had to cancel pre-K class because we didn't have volunteers to serve in the preschool ministry. And I stood at this altar and I wept. I wept so hard that I had people after church texting me, telling me that I know something's wrong and I'm praying for you. And you want to know why I wept, church? I wept because I saw the babies over here and they didn't get to go to class and they didn't get to worship Jesus and they didn't get Jesus taught to them on their level. I wept because we as adults were a hindrance to them that day. We were a hindrance to them because we as a body, I'm not pointing any fingers as a body, we said it's more important for me to be here in this chair than for me to be over there teaching and ministering to these young babies. And it broke my heart because Jesus says, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. He doesn't say the kingdom of God belongs to us. He said the kingdom of God belongs to the people who are like the children. Truly I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And he took the children in his arms, placed them on him, and he blessed them. When we go and when we serve our kids, when we serve the next generation, they are teaching us more than we are teaching them. And that's what broke my heart that day because these kids love God. They love Jesus. If you've ever been in that preschool classroom, they, they know how to pray. They lay hands on each other. They lay hands on the teachers. They know scripture by memorization. These children love Jesus. And we can learn from that. And so it just broke my heart. And I just share that with you because I will say as your pastor, and I can speak on Pastor Sonny's behalf, as your pastors, if the next generation does not matter to you, you're in the wrong place. Because this church will be a church that raises up and trains up the next generation of believers. We will be, amen? We will be. Because I refuse to get to heaven and, and, and have to stand before God and him have to say to me, Brittany, you missed the mark on some things. And I do not want that to be one of them. I do not want that to be one of them. So I love you all. That's the heart posture behind today. That's why we do it. And I know that these, pe these children, these young people, these students are going to bless your socks off today. All right. So without further ado, if you would help me welcome our first student. Our a junior high student, he's getting ready to go into eighth grade, uh, Mr. Gavin Wells. Hello? Okay. Well, you already said my name, but if everybody doesn't know me, I'm Gavin Wells. I'm 13 years old, and today I'm going to be talking about different versions of family. Today I'm going to start off with a quote by Terry Bradshaw. Any Steelers fans in the house? No. I thought you guys looked like good people. Okay. Okay. He said, family is not just an important thing, it's everything. First, I'm going to talk about my football family. I've been playing football since I was five years old, and it's always just been more than the game to me. Um, oh, sorry. Football brings people closer together as it teaches you to persevere, hard work, sacrifice, and to be a leader. I was reminded of the below verse this season, 2 Timothy 4-7. That states, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Yeah. Two seasons ago, I broke my collarbone and was unable to play spring ball. I joined a new team in the fall after recovery, but was still in recovery mode. I didn't earn a starting position and didn't get a lot of playing time. I signed up for the same team the next season and didn't receive a starting position. It wasn't getting a lot of playing time and I was still the newer kid to the team. I was upset, but kept on trusting God. 
work, I also worked hard, encouraged my teammates, and showed up because we were still a team no matter what. About halfway through the season, the coaches started to, know, to notice my worth ethic and my hard work I put in during conditioning and drills. By the next game, they gave me a chance to start, and I showed up with three catches for 60 yards. I earned a starting position for the rest of the season, and I, I remembered to trust God, and I thanked him for giving me that opportunity. I know I'm only 13 years old, but I know God. I have been raised up to fear the, to fear the Lord, and, but I also know that he loves me and that he is my father. You may not have a quote unquote normal family set up. You may have lost a parent, but no matter what, you have a dad and his name is Jesus. Can everybody please turn to Isaiah 40, 11? Give me some time to do that. Isaiah 40, 11 states, he tends his flock like a shepherd, he gathers his lambs in his arms, and he carries them close to his heart. Yeah. Now, by definition, a shepherd is a person who takes care of a sheep. We are a sheep. We are his children. He knows them by name, and he leads them. Right. He leaves the 99 to find the lost sheep. Yeah. Yeah. If you can accept him as your savior and give your life to him, he has so much he wants to do through you and... He wants to do in your life. Remember, he is 99 to find the lost sheep. He could be the father you never had. He could be the friend that's just closer than a brother. He loves you. He has a plan for you. He, he has a plan for you, 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 and yes, even you, Pastor Terry. <laughs> If you can accept him as your family, as your father, you can find that joy, love, and peace that you may not have had for the past couple of years. Yeah. Lastly, I would like to talk about my church family. Everybody in here is your community. These are the ones that push you to be better. Remember, push means pray until something happens. I know I can count on my leaders and my pastors to be there for me like family. I know they will always pray until something happens. Great job, Gavin. We love Gavin. Our next young lady, we have just had the honor and the privilege to see this young lady grow and to flourish. And they've been here, her and her family have been here since launch day. Amen. I'm excited for y'all because then you could be like, oh, geez, one day, one day. Nobody liked that. All right. I know I'm pretty serious, guys, but I can be funny, too. I'm just saying. I'm dressed in all pink with Barbie on. Okay, I can't be that ruthless. Can we please give it up for Miss Jasmine Longoria? Where's she at? Um, good morning, guys. Good morning. Oh, I'm nervous, guys. Bear with me. Bear with me. Uh, okay. Get my good side, sister. Get my good side. Um, um, <laughs> give me a second. Give me a second. So I just want to take time to thank pastors for allowing God to speak to them and allowing me to get up here and spread the word of God. Uh, I want to introduce you guys to my family. My mom, dad, everybody knows them. Lori, Mario, <laughs> my sister Bridget, and Nevea. They're always there for me. They've helped me through this. And um, yeah. So I want to start off with, I think Pastor Brittany was in my notes, because Proverbs 22, 6 says, train up in your child the way he should go, teaching him to seek God's wisdom and will for his abilities and talents. Even when he was old, he will not depart from it. So in the word, it's telling you as a parent to train your child and teach them the word of God and to show them what a found for day, found, firm foundation means. The problem with the 
parents these days is they're getting mad at the children for doing what's wrong and doing like going to the world for the answers, but they never took time and sat there and taught their children what's wrong and what's right biblically. Come on. <laughs> um, next, I want to share the birth of Samson from Judges 13, three through seven. This one's kind of long, guys. Uh, the angel of the Lord appeared to Mohans. Is Mohan? Mohans? Oh. Manoah's wife and said, even though you have been unable to have children, you will soon become pregnant and give birth to a son. So be careful. You must not drink wine or any other alcoholic drink, nor eat any forbidden food. You will become pregnant and give birth to a son, and his hair must never be cut, for he will be dedicated to God as a Nazarite from birth. He will begin to rescue Israel from the Philistines. So, what was his name? Mo. Manoah and his wife, they changed their life, not before themselves, because they knew that God had a plan for his, their son. He knew that he was going to be important to the people, and they followed the vow, the Nazarite vow, and they, um, they changed their life, but to show their child what, a, what it looks like to follow Christ. Like, they were willing to make those changes, not for themselves, but for their child, like, and, um... I just thought that was good. Yeah. Another scripture that I have is Psalms 51.5, the Amplified Version. I was brought forth in a state of wickedness. In my sin, my mother conceived me, and from the beginning, too, I was sinful. A lot of people will be like, oh, then, like, that's in the word. I'm a sinner. Like, it's okay. Like, I can sin. But you just got to get out of that state of sin. You can't get comfortable in that. It's important to get out of that sinful lifestyle because... Let me expose myself, guys. Sometimes I don't want to come to church. <laughs> Sometimes I don't want to wake up. Like, my friends are like, let's hang out Sunday morning. I'm like, Mom. <laughs> but then she comes to my room the next morning, blasting worship music, and was like, get up. <laughs> uh, and sure enough, I'm here today, guys. And um, another example that I wanted to share is um, this week's just been really hard for me, like, the enemy has just been making himself known in my head, you know, telling me I'm not good enough, telling me I'm not worth it, like that I'm not supposed to be here. And there would be times when my dad would come out and I would just be crying on the table, like studying. I'm like, Dad, I can't do this. Like, I can't. Like, this, no. And then he didn't let me dwell. He didn't let me sit in those moments. He would get that anointing oil, put it on my head, pray, and rebuke those spirits that are not of the Lord out of me. And then I would study and I'd be fine. <laughs> Okay, Okay. Um, I'm almost done, guys. <laughs> Another scripture is Deuteronomy 6, 6, and 7. And you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commandments that I'm giving you today. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you're at home, when you're on the road, and when you're going to bed, and when you're getting up. God should be the center of your guys' family. He sh your firm foundation should be built around him. <sighs> Hold on, guys, give me a second. The spiritual battlefield that my generation goes through these days is serious. And if we don't have a firm foundation that we know we can rely on, that we know that's going to be there to pick us up when we fall, then we're going to fall. Okay. My last scripture is Luke 17, 2. It would be better for him if a millstone as large as the one turned by a donkey, were hung around his neck, and he were hurled into the sea, than for him to cause one of these little ones to stumble and lose faith. When people read this scripture, they usually think about children in general, but I want you parents to think about your own children. Think about the children that you were raising. Are you raising them to worship God, or are you part of the reason that they don't come to church? Are you really setting a good example on following God is supposed to look like? Are you really pushing as a parent to walk in faith to see? Are you setting what a godly wife and a godly husband is supposed to look like? Because I'm telling you right now that my generation cannot afford to see the leaders in our life be comfortable in sin. <laughs> okay, guys, I'm done. Hey now, you heard her, right?
They want you parents to fight for them. They want you to fight for them. I got a dote real quick on the Longoria family. Something that they, I think they still do it, but I know they did it for a long time. Lori's shaking her head at me so she knows where I'm going. What time is it at? Five o'clock. See, they knew. At five o'clock, no matter where the Longorias are, if they're at work, school, driving in the car, they all stop at 5 p.m. every single day and pray. Family prayer. And they've been doing that for as long as I can remember. So I know we're going on probably three years now of family prayer. It used to be at 10 o'clock, right? And then they moved it to 5 o'clock. 5 o'clock, they stop and they pray, no matter where they are. So phenomenal. But you heard her. The next generation, they want you to fight for them. They want you to fight for them. Look, I know parents. I know I have a 13-year-old, right? He's just like, you guys are terrible, right? I love it so much. I laugh so much because I'm thinking, yes, I'm terrible now. But when you're like 20, 21, 22, and you're like, I don't know how to survive in this world, I'm giving you tools for how to survive in the world. Amen. Well, the next young man, I don't know him hardly at all, um, but he's new to our church, so we thought we would uh, give him a shot today and let him, let him teach, see what he comes up with. But uh, please help me welcome uh, Samson Torres. <laughs> Hello, my name is Samson Torres. I am the lead servant son here at the church where our vision is to build a church for God around the presence of God. Today's topic is the value of family. Now, the value family is doing as the Acts Church did. We devote ourselves to God's word and prayer. We eat, laugh, and celebrate life together. But today, we're going to be talking about what goes against that value, because today's title is Why Families Break Up. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for this day. We pray that Everyone, please learn from everyone who preaches today and that they have a good time. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. Now, today we're going to be um, in the Bible using three examples that focus on Jacob. So, let's go to the first scripture. Please stand for the reading of God's word as we turn to Genesis 25, 29 through 33. Once when Jacob was cooking stew, Esau came from the field, and he was exhausted. And Esau said to Jacob, Let me eat some of that red stew, for I am exhausted. Therefore his name was called Edom. Jacob said, Sell me your birthright now. Esau said, I am about to die. Do what use is a birthright to me. Jacob said, Swear to me now. So he swore to him, sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew now church the main point here is that oh sit down <laughs> you sit down <laughs> the main point here is that jacob deceives esau he knew that he, he was esau was out hunting for some food and what, he, what Jacob did, ever since that Jacob was born, he wanted Esau's birthright. He saw it all the way from the birthright canal. <laughs> and he, he cooked up some stew, ramen, probably soy ramen, because it smells, and then he threw some swordfish steak in there. So, and then he grabbed two palms and started blowing it over there. So Esau would come floating over there like a cartoon character. <laughs> Eventually, he runs over here, and he's screaming at Jacob to give me your food. Now, Jacob was acting like this was a coincidence because he didn't want to act suspicious. So when Esau was begging him, he's like, okay, give me your birthright. Now, Esau thought this was good because it meant no use to him if he dies because no one has a birthright. So... 
He sells his birthright for the stew and eats it. Now, Jacob knew to himself that he was deceiving, and he thought it was okay to deceive. Now, the main point, church, is that a reason why families break up is because we deceive. And we think it's okay, but the reality is is that no one wants to do life with you if you like to deceive. Because that is not why we are here. We are here to do as the Acts Church did. And a church that you could come during grief, a time of grief. Now, let's turn to our, please stand for the reading of God's word as we turn to our second scripture, Genesis 27, 18 to 24. So he went in to his father and said, My father, and he said, Here I am. Who are you, my son? Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done as you told me. Now sit up and eat my game, that your soul may bless me. But Isaac said to his son, How is it that you have found it so quickly, my son? He answered, Because the Lord your God granted me success. Then Isaac said to Jacob, Please come near me, and I may feel you, my son, to know whether you are really my son Esau or not. So Jacob went near to Isaac, his father, who fell him and said, The voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. And he did not recognize him, because his hands were hairy like his brother Esau's hands. So he blessed him. He said, Are you really my son Esau? He answered, I am. Now, Jake, Jacob now lies to his father Isaac because now Jacob needed his father's blessing. So Jacob and Sarah, Jacob, uh, Jacob puts some bare clothing on and Sarah makes the food and then gives it to Jacob and Jacob goes to his father Isaac. Now he took advantage of him because he was blind so he couldn't see but he can hear. So he gives him the game and he eats it. And Isaac, he's questioning, are you really my son Esau or are you Jacob? He says he is Jacob and he keeps repeatedly lying. Unfortunately, he does get the blessing, but then he had to run away to his uncle Laban because Esau was going to kill him. So church, another reason why families break up is because we lie. We lie about gambling. We lie about stealing money. We lie about sex out of marriage. We lie about going to clubs. And you think it's okay, but it's not, because no one wants to do life with you if you like to lie. Could you imagine if the Axe Church was built on lies? It would never exist. That's right. But here's a funny movie quote. In the movie um, Four Christmases, the, the father, the dad, he teaches his son that you cannot spell families without the lies. See, the problem with that quote is, is that we live that way. Right. It's like lies is repeatedly hitting you on the table. He's just slamming your head on the table. Now, for our final scripture, we're going to be going to Genesis 33, uh, Genesis 31, 3, and Genesis 32, 6 through 7. Then the Lord said to Jacob, Return to the land of your fathers and to your kindred, and I will be with you. And the messengers returned to Jacob, saying, We came to your brother Esau, and he is coming to meet you. And there are 400 men with him. Now, church, the final reason why families break up is because... We're fearful, and we're distressed. We, what happens is we get church hurt, and we run away. And we figure that all the other churches are going to hurt us too, and everyone else was going to hurt us too. But that's not, that's not the point. And then what happens is you miss, you miss all the good times. You miss what all the acts church did. You miss 
with how they celebrated life together, how they devoted. And then eventually you put on what people call thick skin. But I checked that cross, and the nails were in Jesus pretty hard. But he didn't have thick skin. He had the armor of God. So, church, unfortunately, yes, you are going to get hurt but you're still going to build up life together with your brothers and sisters in Christ. <clears throat> Just like Jesus did. We're not trusting man. We're not trusting anyone. We're trusting God. So the main point today, church, is that don't be afraid to get hurt, but trust God and do life again with people in Christ. And that is why families break up, because we deceive, we lie, and we fear. And that was my sermon. Great job, buddy. Great job, son. That's our son. I was joking when I said he was new here. <laughs> and I promise he wrote that sermon, did he not? His dad said, go up those stairs and you write that sermon. And she was like, okay. And then he was in there. You know, and then he came down, and he wrote it, and he blessed me so much the other day. He was studying. We were making him study like good parents. Go study. Go study. And he came, I was on the couch, and he comes in, and he says, I was preaching a storm in there. <laughs> and I said, well, amen. I'm so glad. <laughs> I'm so glad. Uh, our next young lady that we um, we have the privilege of hearing from today, uh, I'm so blessed by her. Uh, I have to say, this young woman is a student of the word. Honestly, I would love to do Bible study with her sometime because she will teach me a thing or two, more than likely. Um, every time I see her, she is studying the word, reading the word, knows her word, has a hunger and a thirst for the word of God. Um, so we're so honored to have her in our community. Would you please help me welcome Miss Eva Faulkner? Good morning, good morning. One second. My name is Eva, and as I'm sure you have all have gathered by now, today's message is on family. Now, I remember back in December when Pastor Sonny first told me about what today's message was going to be on, and I contemplated talking about my own family, uh, my own family trials, experiences, both within and outside the church, but none of those topics felt right. So I prayed about it for months, and after frequently praying about it, I felt God lay in my heart the importance of spreading his gospel to the unbelievers in our family. So I started writing a message on that, but it quickly felt incomplete. I knew there was more that God wanted me to say. So after praying more, fasting more, I felt God lay in my heart that although I was supposed to speak about spreading the gospel to our family and what that looks like, that wasn't going to be easy for a lot of people here today to hear because there are a lot of people here today who have been hurt by people that they consider to be their family. And, and instead of demonstrating God's love and forgiveness, they were continuing to hold on to that pain and that bitterness, thereby hindering God's call on their life. Jesus wants his followers to spread the news of his work on the cross so those close to them can access his salvation. But Jesus knows his followers won't be willing to spread his salvation to others if they aren't first willing to forgive others. When I first heard this, it intimidated me. Since this was something I couldn't personally relate to, I knew what it was like to have unbelievers in my family, but I didn't know what it was like to harbor hurt and unforgiveness towards them. I remember asking Jesus, I was like, how am I supposed to to t talk about uh, unforgiveness to a type of pain and hurt I've never personally experienced. And he told me, you may have never experienced it, but I have. This confused me at first, but Jesus quickly revealed what he meant. Throughout the Gospels of Jesus, you'll see a group of religious leaders called the Pharisees. The Pharisees believed um, in all the laws of Moses. They believed in, they put their faith in that, they put their trust in that. Matthew 2, uh, 20, 
3, verses 2 through 3, Jesus tells his students that although they are knowledgeable about Moses, they do not practice what they preach. In Matthew 12, verses 46 through 50, it says, while Jesus was still talking to the crowd, his mother and brother stood outside wanting to speak to him. Someone told him, your mother and brothers are standing outside wanting to speak to you. He replied to him, who is my mother and who are my brothers? Pointing to his disciples, he said, here are my mother and my brothers, for whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. You see, the Pharisees cared more about knowing the laws of their God than knowing who their God even was. So much so that when their God came down in the form of Jesus Christ, they didn't even recognize him or his love or mercy or compassion. The Pharisees' hearts were so hardened that they saw Jesus as a threat and eventually were part of the plot that had Jesus arrested and killed. The Pharisees thought that by doing this, they were doing the will of the Father, unknowingly claiming to be Jesus' brothers and sisters and mothers, claiming to be his family, even as they put him to death. Jesus does understand what it is like to be hurt by the people who are supposed to be his family, and the stories of the Pharisees could have ended here, but despite what happened, Jesus wasn't done. In the book of Acts, after Jesus rose from the dead and ascended to heaven, his church began to grow. This troubled the Pharisees, who still saw the name of Jesus as a threat. This Pharisee named Saul went around and persecuted and killed the followers of Jesus, thinking he was doing the will of God, until he personally encountered Jesus. Can you all please open to Acts chapter 9. We're going to be reading verses 1 through 20. I apologize, it's a lot of reading. Meanwhile, Saul was uttering threats with every breath and was eager to kill the Lord's followers. So he went to the high priest. He requested letters addressed to the synagogues in, Dam in Damascus, asking for the, their cooperation in the arrest of any followers of the way they found there. He wanted to bring them, both men and women, back to Jerusalem in chains. As he was approaching Damascus on this mission, a light from heaven suddenly shone down around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. And the voice replied, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. The men with Saul stood speechless, for they had heard the sound of someone's voice but saw no one. Saul picked himself up off the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he was blind. So his companions led him by the hand to Damascus. He remained there blind for three days and did not eat or drink. Now there was a believer in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord spoke to him in a vision, calling, Ananias! Yes, Lord, he replied. The Lord said, Go over to Straight Street to the house of Judas. When you get there, ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul. He's praying to me right now. I have shown him a vision of a man named Anasis coming in and laying hands on him so he can see again. But Lord, exclaimed Anasis, I've heard many people talk about the terrible things this man had done to the believers in Jerusalem. And he's authorized by the leading priest to arrest everyone who calls upon your name. But the Lord said, go, for Saul is my chosen instrument to take my message to the Gentiles and to kings as well as for the people of Israel. And I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. So Anasis went and found Saul. He laid his hand on him and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road, has sent me so that you might regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Instantly, like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he regained his sight. Then he got up and got baptized. Afterward, he ate some food and regained his strength. S Saul stayed with the believers in Damascus for a few days. And immediately he began pre preaching about Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is indeed the Son of God. Now, a lot of you may have a Saul in your family, someone who has hurt you or those around you, someone who may seem beyond saving. But some of you have also been guilty of being the anesis in your family. God's been calling you to go to the Saul in your family and to pray to him, to uh, touch them, to lead them, to forgive them. But yet, like Anasis, the first thing you say to God is, but Lord. But Lord, they've weakened me. 
Well, 2 Corinthians 12, verse uh, 9 says, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. But, Lord, I can't do this. Philippians 4, verse 13 says, For I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. But, Lord, I can't forgive them. Ephesians 4, verse 32 says, Be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. But, Lord, they've given me such a hard time. Matthew 5, verse 45, a message version says, When someone gives you a hard time, respond with the supple moves of prayer. So then you are working out your true selves, your God-created selves. Jesus was killed by the Pharisees, and later on redeemed a Pharisee who was killing his followers. Jesus took an enemy of his gospel and redeemed him into someone who spread it wherever he went. If Jesus can take a group of people who claim to be his family and hurt him and then redeem him, how much more can Jesus redeem your family if you let him? If, if Jesus can take the story of the Pharisees for his glory, how much more can he turn the story of, his, of your family for his glory? You are called, chosen, sought out by God. He wants to use you to grow his kingdom, to set the example, to be his chosen people, a royal priesthood, a royal nation. But he can't do that if you continue to hold on to the unforgiveness, the anger, the regret, the bitterness. You have to surrender those feelings. Your heart was made to surrender these feelings to God, but in, in, in order to let God heal you so he can also heal your family. Thank you. So powerful, amen? So powerful. I told y'all. Told y'all. Uh, this next uh, young woman that uh, I'm going to bring up, uh, she actually oversees our preschool uh, class. She leads our preschool team. And I have a daughter in preschool. Her name is Michael. And uh, the other day I was picking Michael up from school. Uh, she goes to preschool during the week. And her teacher says to me, she says, hey, I just have to tell you that Michael can pray not like a five-year-old should pray. And I said, oh, thank you so much. And she's like, seriously, like, she prays. And I always say that's because of Jasmine Martinez. <laughs> I don't even pretend like it's my doing as her mom. I'm like, look, we pray. Michael sees us pray. Amen. Jasmine teaches these kids how to pray how they know scripture. We have five-year-olds that can say our whole benediction like on cue. It's incredible. So please help me welcome Miss Jasmine Martinez. Hello, I'm Jasmine Martinez, not a public speaker by trade. As a matter of fact, I work in a spa where silence is appreciated. <laughs> so I'm going to try not to put you to sleep with my spa voice. I've been doing it for 12 years, so forgive me. <laughs> I am the lead servant of the little people, pre-K. And I was actually going to open up with Matthew 18, 1 through 5, but Pastor Brittany already brought it up how when the disciples were arguing who will be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven and God put forth a child, lifted up the child, right? The last became the first and he said these will be the, you know, the highly regarded and if you don't become like a little child and receive me like a child, you will never make it into the kingdom of heaven. So it is a privilege to serve those that God highly regards and I appreciate the opportunity you guys have given me to do that. Um, and that is one of our, our missions in pre-K is that they're confident in worship and bold in prayer. So I'm glad it's working. <laughs> um, my, my sermon is called Beyond Bloodlines, a story of perpetual discipleship and ministry. Uh, my first point was Jesus came to stretch the family beyond its natural limits. So the scripture we're going to open up with is Matthew 12, 46 through 50. While Jesus was still talking to the crowd, his mother and brothers stood outside wanting to speak to him. Someone told him, your mother and brothers are standing outside wanting to speak to you. He replied to him, who is my mother and who are my brothers pointing to? Oh, pointing to his disciples. 
He said, here are my mother and my brothers, for whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and my sister and my mother. If you are not currently being raised by your natural parent or you are a guardian or, or a caretaker or you have adopted someone, uh, we have a message for you. So it's excellent. It's good news. Um, you know, parenting, caregiving, adoption, guardianship, it is a form of ministry. It is a form of discipleship because there is a constant learning between both the guardian and the child being adopted or cared for. And in the Bible, there's many examples. Um, you know, Pharaoh's daughter received Moses and God um, used him to rescue all enslaved Israelites from Egyptian power. Eli and Samuel, when uh, Hannah gave Samuel to Eli to raise as a prophet, he anointed David, the most unlikely candidate as king of Israel. Mordecai and Esther, um, she had no parents that they spoke of, but she was raised by her older cousin. And his subtle, strong presence throughout her story influenced the outcome of an entire people. Uh, through Mordecai's encouragement, Esther courageously revealed herself as Jewish to the king of Persia, an act that God was, would use to save nearly the entire Jewish race. There was Joseph and Jesus. Um, he's not talked about a lot in the Bible, but he did say yes, and he did help raise Jesus, who has changed the course of history infinitely. And then, last but not least, God and us. So God made us alive together with Christ. Even more, he adopted us into his family. By grace, through faith in Jesus, we became sons and daughters of God. So there is another family that's ready to receive you if you feel like you have been abandoned or you have somehow been left out or you have somehow been gypped in life and didn't get to have that natural parent kind of stable environment. Um, you all know, or if you don't know, I raised my niece, Ari, and I've had her since she was five. And um, it's been a ride. <laughs> it's definitely been a ride. Um, but what happens when you find yourself in the hole of your parents' sin. When you're vulnerable and you're a child and you don't have the ability to advocate for yourself. When I, I've lived that life too. I, I had parents, they had me in the church off and on. When I grew up, I lost them to, they went to drugs when I was about 15. And, and I went back and forth whether or not I wanted to share this, but I think it's definitely for somebody, um, whether in this room or on the other side of that camera. And I'll tell you, it's a dark place to be. It's met with a lot of struggles, um, especially when you, you know Jesus, you know some level of light and 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 I I'm blessed that I did know some level of light that I did have Jesus in some way, um, but however there are those that don't at all and I I deeply feel for them, um, and so when you're in the bottom of that and and you're trying to you see the light you remember I w I used to be with God we used to go to church, my dad used to read the Bible in our living room and now we are somehow in this place where we have lost everything and I'm 15 working three jobs, bringing home food for my siblings. Like, where is God in this? And isn't that the question we always ask ourselves? Well, I got to learn in life that God was about to show up in, in my story as he did for all these other people that, um, accomplished great things through the family of God. So my second point is God will provide all your needs, all. 
including mothers, fathers, sisters, and brothers. In Matthew 6, 31 through 33, it says, So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. So what ended up starting to happen was God showed up in my life through other spiritual mothers and fathers. The very first one was my grandmother. She had me dedicated as a baby. I think that made the world a difference. The second would be my high school counselor. Her name was Gerilyn. She was a woman of God. And you know, we lost everything. My grades were suffering. I was working. I was trying to care for these kids um, when I was just a kid myself. And she sat, brought me in her office. She sat me down. She said, I've been praying for you. And this is what we're going to do. My husband and I are going to buy you a car. I know your grades are bad. I made some calls. You're going to go to college, and you're going to move all the way to the southern end of the state. <clears throat> and then there was the, the issue of my siblings. She helped me get them placed with a family so that I could go to college. Could you imagine if I would have declined her offer because I would have felt sorry for myself? If I would have said, no, I cannot do that. I don't have the support if I go out there. It's a risk. I don't know anybody. How am I going to provide for myself? I'm just going to stay here. And I'm just going to keep raising these kids. And I'm just not going to have the faith to step out on this offer. So I did. I did. I went out to college. And what I will say is the, 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 the last set of parents I got re recently spiritually and in my 30s is my Aunt Ruthie and my Uncle David. <laughs> so they're very much like my parents. They sit me down. They correct me. They tell me when, what to do, when to do it. But I've also gotten to experience the beauty of seeing a family that serves God. And it's been a very healing, wonderful thing for me. And not just me, but for Ari. And just like you could get caught in family's perpetual sin, like in our family, it's addiction. There's also family up above the pit that are circling around to pull you up and throw down the rope, right? Doing, being the hands and feet of Jesus. So my Aunt Ruthie was actually raised by her aunt from when she was a baby. And then my Aunt Ruthie has helped me, and then I have helped my niece. And that is one of the best pictures of God's family because that is what we do. We say, hey, I know your struggle. I've been in that hole. Let me, I can, I'm not going to get in the pit with you, but I'm going to pray for you from up here. I'm going to throw down my rope, and if you have the faith for what I have to offer you, yeah. climb up this rope and come up here with me, and let's do this thing. Yeah. My third point is honor what God gives you. For who makes you, oh sorry, 1 Corinthians 4, 7. For who makes you different from anyone else? What do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as though you did not? It would be a disservice to me to stand up here and not tell you about the goodness of God and to complain about my life, even though it was very hard. There was a lot of struggles. But also, for the person who's still an adolescent or a child, if, you, if God has given you his man or woman of God to raise you, honor them. They are not your punching bag. They are not for you to mistreat. There is anger in this type of 
situation, but you have to take it to the feet of Jesus. You have to deal with it, th with it there and let him come in and do the work. Colossians 3.17 says, And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So again, being grateful and appreciating what, who God has put in your life and who God has sent. It may not look like you want it to look. You may say it's not fair. You may be angry. And you can feel those feelings, but don't stay there. Don't stay there because it will affect your entire life. And you have work to do. Just like, you know, Esther and Moses, you have a calling on your life. So don't stay there because that's what the enemy would love to see is for you to stay down there and just keep going in a circle with the rest of the family that decided, you know what, I can't beat this thing. I can't do it on my own. I'm just going to become an addict too and I'm just going to keep going in a circle in this pit. And I have to tell you, one of the, the best things that has happened since we've joined the church is my aunt equipping me with the word of God and then me equipping Ari with the word of God and watching because I did not carry her in the natural but I have carried her in the spirit and I am her spiritual mother. I may have not birthed her, I didn't carry her for nine months but I got her up every morning and I said okay let's do our declarations you know, I am the head and not the tail. I am, a, I am more than a conqueror. And she'd say I'm with me every morning and, and reading the word to her and getting her in church and getting her involved. And now I, I put a sword in her hand. So she go, I saw that little girl battle for her mom in prayer. And it, there was a moment this year, a very proud moment for her, where my sister was paid to speak to a bunch of people at the Capitol in Santa Fe on sobriety and recovery. And that is the fruit of Ari's prayers and her fight for her mom. She, I wasn't going to let her crawl in the pit. She wanted to get in the pit with her, like, come on, I can save you. I said, no, 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 we're going to stand up here. We're going to pray for her. We're going to battle in the spirit. We're going to throw her a rope, but she's got to climb the rope. The fourth point is forgive those who hurt or disappointed you. For if you, uh, Matthew 6, 14 through 15. For if you forgive other people, when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. I also want to read Matthew 18, 21 through 22. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. You know, um, my, needless to say, me and my mother didn't have the best relationship. I went a long time without her, but there was this opportunity um, in the last two months of her life, I was about 27, where God redeemed the time. You know, she was out of my life for about 15 years. She ended up in the hospital with cirrhosis, and I took care of her. I took care of her in the hospital. Um, you would think I'd be super angry with her, but I yearn for the opportunity to see her give her life back to God. So I started taking care of her. I'd go every day, and God is so good that he gave her that opportunity. So for two months, she gave her life back to God. She got baptized again. She... Um, She reconciled relationships. She apologized, and we got that time together, right? It was only two months, but it could have ended a whole lot different 
had there not been people that she was tapped into that were connected to the family of God. So forgiveness is very important. There were some of my siblings that did not go and see her out of anger, and it's not productive. It's better to forgive. It, it's great for you. It'll free you. It'll release you. And then point five, pay it forward. Matthew 5, 10, 8. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. And then Galatians 6, 9 through 10. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest. If we do not give up, therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially, everyone say especially, Especially. to those who belong to the family of believers. So I can love you well because Jesus loved me well. I can forgive you because Jesus forgave me first. I can adopt you and care for you because Jesus adopted me and cared for me. Discipleship, right? Following him, being an example, being the hands and feet of Jesus. And I'll close with this. Jesus has built a family of perpetual ministry and discipleship born again of the spirit and we love because he loved us john 4 19 thank you so good right i love it be the person above the pit Woo! be the person above the pit Throw a rope down. Man, that'll preach right there. You know me in my mind. I'm thinking, how can I get a pit? (laughs) (laughs) Pastor Nisi's like, no, no pits. But to, to close this out today, uh, I'm so proud of this young man. We have just seen him grow and walk in the Lord. And I'm telling you, it's not how you start. It's how you finish, right? You can have the most sorted out, crazy mess of a start, right? But God says, hey, the end of a thing is better than its beginning. So please help me welcome our last speaker for today, uh, Joseph Ferguson. Amen. Good morning. How are we doing today? Good, good, good. Welcome to the church. Uh, My name is Joe. I have the pleasure of being a servant here in the house of the Lord, uh, where our vision is to build a church for God, around the presence of God. Amen. All righty. So first and foremost, man, I got to give it up to the individuals that came up on this platform before me. Can we give it up? Come on. Yeah. Uh, also have to give recognition to our pastors, the lead servants of the house, pastors Brittany and Sonny Torres. You know, it's amazing to see individuals that just completely give themselves away to the Lord and, and to have those as mentors in my life. I'm forever grateful for that. Um, so we are, we are speaking on the, the family value today in the house where, um, all the values are posted up in TC Central. Uh, the axiom that we have for family here in the church is we do life together. We do as the Acts Church did. We devote ourselves to the word of God and to prayer. We eat, laugh, and celebrate life together. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and, and open up with a scripture. Um, does anybody have an idea of where we might have found that axiom from? What book? We do as what church did? The Acts Church, maybe it came out of the book of Acts. Uh, So I'm going to go ahead and open up with Acts 2, verse 42. Um, And it is custom in the house that we stand for for the reading of God's word. 
Acts 2.42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and pray for us this morning. Father God, I thank you for the opportunity that you have brought forth, Father God. God, I thank you for, for every individual that has come up here and spoken a word um, directly from you, Father God. God, I just pray right now that you bless the lives that are, that are here in person as well as the lives of the individuals that are watching this online and streaming with us, Father God. God, that you have you've just given us a word that is meant for somebody, Father God. It is a right now word, Father God. It is a word that is that you have given to each one of us individually, specifically for somebody or some some individuals father god so we thank you in jesus name we pray Amen. all right yeah y'all can be seated <clears throat> so the word family as defined uh in the dictionary right is a basic social unit consisting of parents and their children considered as a group whether dwelling together or not but as I scan the room right now, I see seats full of my family. All right. Individuals that I do what with? Life. life, right? Individuals that I do life with. See, it's not just church events, right? But I do know we have one coming up. It's uh, the first Friday what dinner? Family. family. Oh, right, right. Yeah, the first Friday family dinner, right? Come on. We do... We do graduations together, right? What are we celebrating today, right? It's Generation Sunday. We got plenty of individuals that are in the house right now that are going to come up here and be recognized for the hard work that they put forth. We do birthdays together, sporting events, right? How about, let's go back, baptisms, right? We celebrate together, amen? What did Jesus call family? That's where I'm going to go right now. Uh, we're going to open up to Mark 3.35. Um, this is another version of what we've heard a few times already today. <clears throat> I had to get, get at Eva a little bit. She was up in my notes. <laughs> Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. Did Jesus have a list of qualifications to be part of his family? Whoever does God's will is my mother, my brother, and my sister, right? We have one qualification. He gave us one thing to do, church. He gave us one thing to do to be part of a family, amen? Come on. Our mission should be accepting others where they're at. Our mission should be loving on them, helping them, and encouraging them to be a better version of themselves not just on a Sunday morning, but Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Guess what? We're going to do it again on Sunday. Amen? Is it easy? It's going to take a little bit of work, huh? It's going to take some accountability. Where's the men of movement at? We some dogs in here. So I remember uh, three years ago now, I was introduced to something from, from the gentlemen that, that were just recognized the Meta Movement um, during my first fast. And that was uh, an accountability partner. So what is an accountability partner? Uh, though the source of Wikipedia defines an accountability partner is someone who supports you to keep a commitment to a desired goal. This person is often a trusted friend or acquaintance who will check in with you about your progress in a particular area. Now for myself, what, what began from a 21 day fast turned into something far greater than 21 days, let me tell you, okay? What did I do? I surrounded myself with a brotherhood that has helped to encourage me and strengthen me in some of my hardest times of life thus far as well as stand beside me arm in arm during some of the most memorable times of my life thus far. That, to me, is what the word family is all about. That, to me, is what the church is not just striving to do, but this house, that is what we are doing. Amen? 
So I'm going to actually, uh, I'm going to close with this. One thing I want, I want to make sure that I encourage everyone here today. It doesn't matter where you're at in life. Our goal as believers is to advance the kingdom of God and increase the family. Find yourself an accountability partner that's going to help you to pursue the perfect will of God in your life. Be an accountability partner for somebody in your life. We are out to reel people in, right? Jesus told, Jesus told the disciples, I want you now, to no, no longer you're not a fisherman anymore, now you're a fisher of man, right? To, to go ahead and advance the kingdom of God. So that's what I want to encourage you today is just to be somebody's accountability partner. Find yourself an account. It doesn't matter where you're at. We all need to be held accountable in life. And that's what family does. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today. If this message has blessed you, we would like to encourage you to share it with a friend. To learn more about us, find us online and on social media at The Church PHX. See you next time.